Good morning, Revolution. We're live here on Facebook, YouTube, other platforms. How are we doing, Joe, Rosana? Good morning, Good morning. Revolution. Good morning, it, Revolution. It's a humid Friday morning here in New York City, but I can't complain too much. It could be raining more. What's it like out there in California? Is it hot? Sunny? No, not yet. Sunny? <laughs> not hot yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm well, always afraid to complain about the weather here because it seems like the rest of the country's yeah. got it worse. Or you'll get an earthquake or something. Yeah. Better not yeah. To complain out in California. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had an interesting week in the news. Um, starting with on Tuesday, Biden gave the uh, kind of commemoration speech for the massacre in Tulsa, which happened 100 years ago. So did y'all listen to that? Some of it. Yeah. Okay. What did you think, Joe? What'd you think? Uh, I thought it was a, a, a very uh, important speech. Um, I think it's the first time an American president ever gave a speech like that. I mean, when, when has it been said that, I don't know, what was it? 33 members of the House and members of the Klan and uh, four or five senators were members open. Of course, there were a whole lot more that were in the closet, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and so that was important. And I think that uh, more importantly, uh, or as importantly, was the connections that he made between Tulsa and uh, what happened uh, in, what was the name of that city? Right in, in uh, the Carolinas where the Klan marched and the neo-Nazis, Rosanna, Michael. Uh, Greensboro, Greensboro. Not Greensboro, no. uh, where they were saying Jews will not replace us. Um, just a, you know, a couple months, a couple years ago, huh? I can't remember. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Anyway, right, right, a yeah. straight line between Tulsa and, and the neo-Nazis marching uh, and what happened uh, on January the 6th. Yeah, that was very significant. I, you know, I, I, I took it to heart when he was talking about, I guess, you know, he has some Irish ancestry, just like my, my father's family. And he was talking about the history of the, the second foundation of the Klan in the 1920s. We see that mm. really, it's a famous picture of the Klan walking down uh, Pennsylvania Avenue and he kind of drew, drew that out. You know, it was very normal to be an open member of the Ku Klux Klan at that time. And Trump kind of normalized that. He kind of normalized, you know, that white supremacy again. And I took it to heart because he talked about the, the massacre in Tulsa and how it also affected people like him as well, you know, as, as Irish Catholics. Um, in fact, the Klan burned a cross in my grandfather's yard for being an Irish Catholic. He was living in uh, Indianapolis at the time. And he found out years later, a, a kid he was going to high school with said, um, I'm sorry, my dad did that to you. So his father was a member of the Klan. So crazy I think things. I, I think it's a, it marks a new day in the fight against racism. Mm -hmm. I really feel like, you know, when you have the president uh, so openly talk about those things, uh, you know, just, and not only that, but it, it does make that connection with the Irish that you normally you don't, people forget about the Italians and the Irish and, you know, and, and how they were discriminated against back in the day. And so to make that connection, it, it really, I think, well, I'm hoping that it, it helps others uh, to, to see that this is a trend and this is not, you know, it, it's not something that is just exclusively to the color, color of your skin. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's also very significant. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I thought it was powerful, as Joe was saying, this is the first time that I've ever heard a president step forward and say, you know, the, the threat on this country isn't Al Qaeda. The principal threat is not Al Qaeda. It's not the immigrants. It's, you know, it's white supremacy. And that's according mm -hmm. to the statistics of, you know, the intelligence community. So I thought that, again, drawing a direct uh, line to what happened on January 6th, which is our next topic, the January 6th commission. Before you move to January 6th, I just want to make two quick go points. Go ahead, go ahead. You know, um, Rosanna makes an important point that it marks a new day in the fight against racism, which also means that we have to have a deeper understanding of racism and white supremacy. And I'm glad that that was brought out that way, white supremacy, because one of the things that happened and one of the mobilizing characteristics of January 6th was the whole issue of the creation of a white identity. So one time the Irish were Irish, 
another time the Italians were Italian Americans and, and, and so on and so forth. Now they're all white Americans and, 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 and they, bought, they, were, they were convinced to buy into this myth of superiority and, 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 and people were buying into it. And, and that's an important issue. Secondly, what the economic issues that were raised in that speech were important. You know, he made the point that that, that black home ownership is less now than it was when the Fair Housing Act was created. And that's because of the Sun Prime swindle when they went after black and Latino and senior citizens in, 19, in, in 2000, 2000 to 2007 prompted the Great Recession. They knew what they were doing. They targeted these families with these escalating ballooning loans. They betted against them and they almost brought the whole darn world economy down. And, uh, and if we're going to address systemic racism today, uh, you're going to have to address the economic underpinnings of it. I just saw a study done about police killings, by the way. And he didn't mention the criminal justice system in, in that speech, uh, Rosanna. But one of the things I saw this morning was that the, the, a study has shown that the number of, of, of Latinos killed by the police in the last 10 or 15 years is double, mm -hmm. double what they thought it was, double. And one of the problems is, is that they don't count you know, and so they have to look into the, the police departments don't count it. And so you have mm -hmm. to take. So this issue of systemic racism, Michael, is a, is a big, big problem. I'm sorry, I just wanted to make those. No, that's, that, those are important points. Those are important points. Yeah. And so but connecting, you know, what happened in Tulsa 100 years ago, the, the, the speech the president made, and then the January 6th commission, which is, you know, facing a lot of resistance in Congress. What do we think about that? How, you know, we, we, we can celebrate this new, I guess, era of, um, you know, focusing in on white supremacy, which can be celebrated, of course. But in terms of January 6th, I feel like a lot of people are forgetting about it, you know. And so what are we going to do about that? What do we think of this commission? Rosanna. Well, that's, it's absolutely necessary. You know, that thing needs to be looked into because the tie, the, the connections have to be made um, between who did it? The Republican Party, big business. Who funded it? And 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 uh, and also its international connections, because this is an international conspiracy, extending from Brazil all the way up to Northern Europe, Russia, and uh, Amsterdam, and you know so on and so forth. And so we gotta gotta find out what's going on in order to deal with it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. I think we need to uh, keep it alive and uh, and make sure that all of these things get uh, put out in the open um, for for everyone to see and, and how vulnerable the, the United States is to these kinds of attacks. And I mean, the Republicans, there's some Republicans who are still calling for, I think, I forget who said something about there should be something like what happened, I think, was in Myanmar or something like that. Can't remember, but um, you know, we have to call those those Republicans out. People need to to take note of these kinds of of things because they're not really for it, but they're they're blinded to it and they're looking the other way. And we've got to make sure that people stop looking the other way and really face what what you know the reality and the and the dangers that our whole country faces by, by not taking this on. I remember back to like October and November when our, when our party was uh, launching its uh, vote against fascism campaign. There were others, you know, on, from the center all the way over to the left saying, ah, you can't vote out fascism. And we never said you could. And I think January 6th is a perfect example of how, you know, that wasn't exactly a, the electoral defeat of Trump was a setback for the fascist danger, but it was not a decisive defeat right. of the extreme right danger in this country. So the fight continues there. That was um, one of the best slogans we ever had. I Vote agree. against fascism, people, was one of the best slogans we ever had. Mm -hmm. You know, 
Look at what happened on January the 6th. And look at what's continuing to happen. You know, they're, 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 they're continuing to, to mobilize, suppressing the vote. They got bills in almost all 50 states trying to gerrymander and find all different kinds of ways of stopping people from voting. And, uh, you know, Noam Chomsky said, Rosanna, that the Republican Party is the most dangerous political party in history. And I think, he's just, I think that's true. I heard a German comrade actually around that time, November, she said, uh, had we had that mentality, you know, back in the early 1930s, the course of history may be different. That's interesting, yeah. you know. Um, but in other news, what's happening in Congress also is the infrastructure plan. So, you know, is it gonna pass as it is? Should the Democrats compromise? Do, do we need some wiggle room? What's going on with that? Cause we have to have an infrastructure plan. I know the, the uh, United Steel Workers are putting out some good um, commercials, like promotional videos of why we need that the infrastructure plan. Um, what do we think? Should the Democrats compromise? Well, no, well, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, but uh, you know, I think we have to look at the whole entire picture. And depending on what that compromise is, because some of these compromises tear down what you're trying to build or what you're trying to implement. So, you know, we have to be mindful of that. But, uh, you know, it doesn't look like the Republicans are willing to compromise on anything. So, you know, let's try to pass it along, you know, through, through the reconciliation process and, and let's, get, let's get going. You're right. They had the same attitude towards Biden-Harris that they had towards Obama-Biden. Mm -hmm. Block. No. Big, fat, no. Mm -hmm. Hell no. We're not going to give you nothing. And uh, they, were, they were just a big, giant heap of racist, uh, ultra-conservative uh, uh, opposition. And uh, so, you know, um, Go on, pass the damn bill. <laughs> and but 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 the speech in Tulsa also said another thing, Michael, and that was that you got two senators, one from Arizona, the other from where is uh mansion from West Virginia, West Virginia yeah. who vote more with the GOP than they do with the, their own mm. party. Two of them. Let's get them out. <laughs> Well, that's the thing, you know, you wonder, it really is a shame. I mean, you understand it's the two parties always have to be in opposition to each other, but you would think that the Republicans to protect their constituencies and, you know, hold those seats, they would try to, you know, move a little bit more in a direction that's, you know, bipartisan, but it's not happening. Like Joe said, there's a lot of, uh, there's a book I read not long ago called The Blue and the Red, talking about how, you know, it's just been split down the aisle ever since the late 90s and it's just become so so polarized so um but th there needs to be an infrastructure plan it has to pass immediately were you going to say something joe well you know <clears throat> the infrastructure plan i mean the, the the jobs report came out today and they created uh 500 000 jobs so everybody's happy about that last month quarter of a million jobs were created. And everybody was, oh, you see, we got to cut off the uh, unemployment supplement. The 300 people don't want to work, they're getting paid too much money. We need to force people. Now they're singing a different tune because it, it, it uh, but unemployment is still close to 6%. That's the official. Unofficial is probably 12% among black, Latino, youth age is, is even higher. So people are still hurting. And- uh, we... Sorry. Go ahead. Em yeah, employment isn't enough. It has to be a livable wage. You know, I mean, you, you, you can have two or three jobs and still just barely make ends meet. So we have to look beyond that. You know, the unemployment rate is one thing, but the, you know, a livable wage it has to be that. It has to be a part of that struggle. It has to be part of that call. 
That's what a lot of our YCLers are dealing with here in New York. A lot of them, you know, young people, they were laid off. A lot of them were college graduates and they couldn't work for a long time because of the pandemic. Now that a few of them are going back to work and these restaurants they're working at, you know, just as a placeholder job as they see it, you know, before they find something else, they're not paying them the minimum wage, which is $15 an hour here in the city. Like mm -hmm. Chipotle, it's paying them $11 an hour. So, you know, SEIU and other unions are out there talking to the Blasio about, you know, taking them to court. So it is a constant struggle. It's definitely a constant struggle. Um, I know I noticed an interesting article on the People's World yesterday uh, regarding the massive grave of, I think it was like 215 indigenous uh, children mm -hmm. found uh, in Canada, you know, and I think that's, we, we, all, we talk a lot about racism. We talk about, you know, the problems with immigration and, and, and so forth, but, um, Often in our rhetoric, I feel like we miss the uh, the struggle for indigenous, the, the, you know, the, uh, living on reservations and, and all of the things that the indigenous communities suffer and how they're not truly represented. Um, I know in the 2018 midterm elections, there were a few indigenous women who were elected uh, to Congress that made headlines. But then you see this mass grave uh, discovered and you wonder, you know, what in the world's going on? What's happening? What do we think of that? Well, genocide. what's happening? Yeah, it's genocide. It's just, it's, and, and even, well, I find it even more disgusting that the Catholic Church was, was involved in all of that, you know, along with the, the molestation they're involved in. It's just such a contradiction in, you know, um, in the preaching and the actual practice. And it's just, it's horrifying, just horrifying. And unfortunately, we need to also face these, these atrocities and make sure that, you know, we're mindful, we're, we're aware of these things so we don't allow this to happen ever, ever again. We can't just hide it. It's as painful as it feels to learn about these children and, you know, they were just dumped in, in this mass grave and it's just horrifying. It reminds me of something, tying it back to Biden's speech. Uh, they're going to think that we're all gaga for Biden this week. But I thought there was something to take out of the speech. And it was just because history silenced it doesn't mean it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that can also be said for, for this massacre and for the, you know, the, the overall genocide of, of the uh, Native peoples uh, here in the continent. Joe, were you going to say something? No, I'm saying these stories need to be told. They have to be told. There was a Tom Hanks, the actor, did a op-ed in the New York Times this morning, I saw, drawing attention to this. He was talking about Tulsa and how he didn't even know it happened. He didn't even know it happened until two years ago. He read a story about it in, in the New York Times. And all of this history is hidden, is suppressed. Them boys want to talk about cancel culture. They're experts at it. Right. <laughs> They've been canceling culture for 400 years, you know? And, 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 and the truth, and, and because this history has been suppressed, people don't really know what happened in the, in, uh, in the establishment of capitalism and colonialism, what well, started off as colonialism anyway, when the U.S. Republic was in uh, uh, the genocide and the murder and, and the disease and the torture and, and the rape that took place, you know? They beat my great-grandmother to death with a belt soaked in water. She was a, a, a Native American woman, a slave in Alabama because she wouldn't carry water. You know, beat her to death with a belt soaked in water with holes cut in it to peel off the skin. That's the story my grandmother used to tell, you know? And, 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 and so, and this happened repeatedly, you know, um, systematically, you know? Uh, they say, Biden said, <laughs> you're right, Michael. They're gonna say, hey, Joe loves Biden. Bi he said that, that it wasn't a riot, it was a massacre, but you could have added it was a systematic massacre. Yeah. Systematized. Yeah. 
you know, and uh, and that's the truth, uh, part of the truth of the uh, growth of the American Republic. Mm -hmm. Tom Hanks says we got to make movies about this. Oh, totally, totally. I I know. Remember the movie going back to the Ku Klux -Klu Klan, Birth of a Nation. Everyone knows the Birth of a Nation movie. Mm. I know a few years ago it wasn't widely publicized, but they did a Birth of a Nation from the African American standpoint. I don't know if it was an independent film or something. Mm. I watched it in a class or something, but I thought it was really good that they showed the other side of you know Birth of a Nation. Um, you know what the African American people uh, suffered and so forth. And so, and for everyone watching, you know, I think, again, we have to reiterate, this is the first time that these things are being brought up. It wasn't just, you know, Biden this week as a U.S. president, not only uh, emphasized the, the, the Tulsa massacre, but he also, after four years of Trump ignoring, you know, the LGBT struggle, now that it's Pride Month, he commemorated Pride Month, you know, and so it's a new rhetoric. And Biden wouldn't be doing that, in my opinion, if it wasn't for all these people's movements who he knows put him in power and helped him defeat Trump. You know, if it wasn't for the LGBT community, the black folks that turned out in Georgia and other places across the country, you know, the immigrant community and so forth. And so, you know, you wonder what's, what's it gonna be like 10 years from now? What's it gonna be like 10 years from now as these people movements continue and their struggles, you know, for liberate, we see the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement and all the mobilizations last summer, the mobilizations now around Palestine, you know, where, where's that gonna take our political um, spectrum, our political scene overall here in, you know, a decade from now. So we'll see. Very I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that these are really important, you know, there's, there are important experiences and struggles that we always have to keep in mind what we're learning from them so that we can continue to move them forward, you know, uh, and we're not, uh, we're not um, infiltrated with ideas that split us up, that this, you know, that that uh, bring disunity to our struggles. That's what I think we need to be very mindful of and be careful about. Even rumors and things like that, we have to be very careful within our 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 movements that we're involved with. Uh, being very mindful of what you believe, what you don't believe, things like that, and just be very objective and strategic. That will help our movements move forward as opposed to, because we know the right is active in every aspect of our work in some form or another. So we have to be very mindful, check our egos constantly so that we don't allow that to get in the way of what's good for the whole, you know? And uh, Biden said all of these things and, and those are all important things and we can't ignore it just because he's a Democrat. We, we can't, you know, they're, they're significant changes that that you know, as communists, we we you you know we live in the real world. We live in, in the objective uh, world. Not uh, you know we don't we're not selective, but we you know and and uh, so we look at what's best for the whole, not just for one one aspect or anything like that. So yeah, I agree. That's we my can take condemn on what it. needs to be condemned and celebrate what needs to be exactly. celebrated. Exactly. You know? Yes. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well. Um, I think you had the last word, Rosanna, but I think it's important that we have to uh, remind everyone watching that we have two important events coming up. Um, we have a weekend of awareness, a weekend of education coming up, uh, not this weekend, but next weekend. So Saturday, June 12th, we have an event called the Radical Perspectives on Abolition from the Electoral Struggle to Community Control, Community Control of the Police. And so uh, our featured speakers will be, you know, Frank Chapman, a couple comrades who were incarcerated themselves and so forth. And then the next day on Sunday, June 13th, we have uh, the Marxist classes, which is a series we do on a monthly basis, this time on imperialism, exploitation, and the role of U.S. workers in the global working class struggle. And that'll be uh, led by uh, our comrade Taryn leading that discussion. And so, Good morning, revolution. Be careful this weekend and join us in the struggle. Be safe out there. Bye. See you. Good morning, revolution. Bye.